Good afternoon. It's a wonderful privilege to be with you today. I'm going to take this out. Um, what wonderful worship and singing and hearing of the Word of God. We could end the service right now and consider that we've met with God. Amen? Amen. But Pastor Ivan invited me to speak when we came, and I'm submitting to him. In doing so, um, our main goal in being here this weekend was to attend the wonderful wedding yesterday. And my, what a beautiful wedding it was. And uh, again, we were very glad to be able to travel all the way from the southern border, not Mexico, but Iowa. We live in northeast Missouri. We're Missourians. And... My wife, beautiful wife, Judy, stand and give your Miss USA wave. And then my daughter, Abigail, Abby, practice your Miss USA wave. There you go. You know that wave they do in Miss USA. So we were glad. We were really looking forward to this time of being with you. Ever since we heard about the wedding and that it was going to be happening, um, we didn't realize how much family would be traveling in and how large this wedding would be, but our desire was to be here because we do consider Pastor Ivan and his wonderful wife, Valentina, our close friends, but also family. Uh, you know, when we have God as our Father, that means that we're of the same family. Is that true? We're the same family. And so just like you, many of you traveled from Washington and Oregon. I think I even saw a license plate from Alaska and I met people from Atlanta. I mean, you guys travel for weddings. We thought we were traveling three hours with something. But you guys travel for a wedding. But the reason you do that is because you love this family and you wanted to be here. That's what family does, true? And so that's why we came is because we love family. And even though you don't know us, uh, many of you don't know us, we are part of your family. Because, again... That's because of the work that Jesus Christ has done in our lives. Can I hear an amen? amen? Because of what he's done, he's joined us to the same family and we have the same father. And so, again, it was a privilege and a pleasure meeting several of you last night. I also didn't realize how long your weddings are. We, we had a wedding in Heartland yesterday as well. A couple of our Bible college students got married at the exact same time at 2 o'clock. And at 3 o'clock, if you saw us on our phones, we weren't Twittering and texting and doing all those things. We, my wife, while we were waiting on this wedding to start, we had on the wedding back home online on our, on our webpage. So we were watching that wedding while we were waiting for this wedding to begin. And it started about 2 o'clock, and at 3 o'clock it was over. That's just kind of how we do weddings. And so we were here yesterday, and what a wonderful wedding. I mean, the, the, the singing and the fellowship and those kinds of things. And at five, at 5 o'clock when it was time to finish eating, and honestly, that was one of the other reasons we came, was for the food. We love your food. And so we came and, and enjoyed everything. And after about three hours, we ate. And it's like, well, this is, this is good. This has got to be, this is, they kissed each other. You all saw the kiss. And so they put the rings on. It was like, hey, it's, it's, it's over. It's done. It's great. And we got up to leave, and one of the uh, people from this church, Peter, said, well, it's actually about half over. And we're like, what? Half over? And they go, yeah, there's going to be more. And we're like, well, we probably should go back to our room and prepare for today. And so then when we came in today, and we asked Pastor Ivan, what time did you leave last night? And he said, oh, about 11 o'clock. And I'm like, Wow. You Slavic people really love weddings. And so praise God. But again, we're so privileged to be here. We come from a church about three hours from here called Heartland. Um, and so we've had the pleasure and the privilege of having Pastor Ivan and his family and, and even Leon and Kathy, if they're here today, and different ones of you travel down and be with us there. And then we've had the privilege of coming here for your youth conference and, and at other times. And again, it's just very special for us together as the people of God. And so thank you very much for this opportunity. And 
as I was preparing what to speak today, and I've got my watch, okay, so you're safe. I know what time I should be done. But as I was thinking today about what to speak about, it was because we were primarily coming for the wedding, not to speak. I would have been perfectly happy just to sit there and not speak. I don't have to speak everywhere that I go, but thank you again, Pastor Ivan. I really do believe the Lord gave me a word because I was, we were so, we love weddings. At Heartland, we, even though ours are shorter, our weddings are shorter, but we love weddings. We love the institution of marriage. We love seeing a man and a woman come together, called by God, to unite their lives together for the rest of their lives. We love that. And the reason, I think the primary reason that we love it is because it's the, the bestest and the closest picture that we have out of the Bible of what our relationship with Jesus Christ is supposed to be like. Okay? There's many different pictures, there's many different stories, there's many different parables about the kingdom, there's many different expressions in the Bible about what our relationship with God, with our Savior, Jesus Christ, is supposed to look like. But the most intimate, the closest relationship that we have this side of heaven besides our relationship, or I should say in, con in conjunction with our relationship with Christ, is the institution of marriage. There's no closer relationship than that. I have some wonderful children. We have 14, our 14th grandchild on the way, and I love being Paul. Paul. I love being a grandpa. It's, my, it's one of my favorite titles is I'm a pawpaw. And so it's a great relation. I love kids. And, so, and, and they're at the stage where they think I do everything best. They think, they think grandpa's the greatest because I'm grandpa. And so I love that relationship. I love the relationship that I have with my children. But the closest, most intimate relationship that I have is with my beautiful wife, Judy. That's the most closest relationship that I have. And that's just, uh, for whatever age you are in here, this, this marriage that happened yesterday, as they were up here saying their vows and they were, they were getting ready to close the deal and put the rings on, I'm sitting there at my table and I'm reminded of who we are as the church, who we are as the people of God. How many understand we're the people of God, right? We're the church, and I heard these brothers come up and speak about this, about us being the church, the body of Christ, and, and again, the, the, the closeness, the relationship that Jesus wants to have with us, even as the brother got up and sang about the prodigal son, and, or uh, the people that got up and sang about the prodigal son, and, and Jesus, the picture of the father running to the son, we see this love, this great love that God has for his people. And so he says, what he's done is, is that God loves us so much that it's, it's unfathomable, this great love. And it's not a far off distance love. It's a very close and intimate, a walk that we can have with him every day where it's heart to heart joined oneness with him. And so again, we don't use earthly marriage to compare ourselves to our relationship with God we use our relationship with God in comparison to our earthly marriage. It says that in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. It says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. How many are glad that Christ gave his life up for the church? Amen. We're all glad about that. But he just didn't give it up as an assignment. He gave his life up for the church because he loves his bride bride and that's what I saw yesterday as we're thinking about this relationship with Jesus Christ is is this Sophia and David what a wonder great name by the way my name's David his name was David Sophia and David standing up here and they're looking at each other and that time when he held her hand up you know and they made him hand, hold it higher and all that and all that kind of stuff and you were seeing this wedding go on and can I tell you people of God there's coming a day there's going to be a great wedding between the bridegroom and the bride, and we are the bride. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that, you know, you won't find the actual phrase bride of Christ in the Bible, but you see plenty of references in there where it talks about us being bride, and it talk, mainly talks of this word, uh, I'm not sure how you say it in your Russian language, but it's the word betrothal. 
okay? Betrothal. We also use a word like courtship, engagement. And this is what we saw happening yesterday was I don't know how long David and Sophia have been courting. I don't know how long they've been engaged. But what we saw was the consummation of that. We saw the finality of that, that that betrothal and that courtship and that engagement was leading up to a day that they would stand here and be married, praise God. Well, we understand as the people of God that we're in the same phase right now in our lives as the church. We're not completely, we have not yet seen him face to face like we will someday. But we in this earth as the people of God right now are called and our relationship with Jesus is one of courtship. It's one called betrothal. We are engaged to Jesus right now. And you say, well, that sounds kind of funny. You're engaged to Jesus right now. Well, let's look at the word of God. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5 says this. Isaiah 54 and verse 5 says, for your husband is your maker. That means our creator is our husband. Now you say, that sounds weird or that sounds kind of out there. I'm telling you, it's in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5. Look it up for yourself. For you, your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And he's your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. And if that passage wasn't enough to convince you, that God has designed himself, he has designed his son Jesus Christ to be our bridegroom. Hosea chapter 2 and verses 19 through 20 says this. Here's where this word betrothal comes in. He says, I will betroth you to me forever. Now I like that word forever because we understand a marriage in this earth is to be forever. Is that true? It's supposed to be forever. That's how it's supposed to be. Well, eternally, our relationship with Jesus Christ, him being the bridegroom and us being the bride, that is to be forever and ever and ever. Praise the Lord. Throughout eternity, we will love each other that way. But it says, yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness. We heard about that in some of the sermons today. In righteousness, I will betroth you to me in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion. How many are glad this morning we serve a compassionate Lord? And he's long, suffering, su he's long suffering and he's patient with us. And it goes on to say, and I will betroth you to me. Speaking of Jesus, in faithfulness, then you will know the Lord. And can I submit to you today in the time that I have, this should blow our minds. This is incredible and some of the most Amazing revelation. Again, as, as teenagers and young people in this place, many times we can get uh, stuck. We can get, what's our path? What's our future? What's, what's God have for me? Which direction I can, am, I, am I supposed to go? But when we get a great uh, an understanding and a revelation that as a young man of God or a young daughter of God, what he's made me a part of is the greatest thing this side of heaven, which is being a part of his bride, the church. There's nothing more valuable in the earth besides the Son of God's presence. It's His church, His people. And this is what's being built in this place. This is what's being built in Oregon and Washington. Everywhere that you've traveled from is that God is about the business of building His Son's bride. What a father. What a father that He would, he would so see it fitting to prepare a bride for His Son. And so again, being here at this wedding was so wonderful. And this word betrothal, uh, if you look it up and, and, and really look in the definitions of it, it quite simply means this. And I like things simple. I am from Missouri, so you got to show me what it means. And I like to keep it simple. And the definition of that word, it comes from a word called harmozo, which means it's also where we get that word harmony in things. But that word betrothal means to be joined. That's what it means. It means to be joined to, to be joined with. And so when it says that we're, be, we're betrothed to Christ, that means that we are now and forevermore joined and being joined to him. And so even as David and Sophia were said their vows, and at some point they left last night. I thought for, for this message it would be a great picture if I could just have them come back up here today and be a part of this sermon. But for some reason I didn't think they would want to do that. 
that they would want to be here today. They'd probably want to be somewhere else. As they're enjoying this first season, this first day after their marriage. What a sacred thing. What a wonderful thing. But what's happened is, is two people, a man and a woman. And I might say, to, in, in today's world, it's very important to declare this from every platform. Marriage is meant and designed by God be, to be between a man and a woman. A man and a woman. Okay? That's how he's designed it because it's a beautiful picture. Okay? It's not two hymns and it's not two she's. It's not Jesus and a him, it's Jesus and his bride, her, the church. And so this is what we're, we have entered into in this, this betrothal, this, this thing called right now in, in earth time. Right now, us as the people of God, we have been betrothed to Christ. And if you look at the culture in the Bible days of this thing called betrothal, there were some things that had to happen, that had to take place for the marriage that was to come. Just like Sophia and David had to walk through certain things with this father, not just pastor, that's a double whammy. Oh my, I feel sorry for David. He not only had to look at him as a father, but he's a pastor in the church. Oh my goodness, that makes it even more, the standard higher, it, it seems like. But there were steps, part of this betrothal, part of this courtship, that they had to walk through for this, to debate, this day to happen. Does that make sense to you? And in, the, in the, the biblical days, it was the same thing. The same thing was true, that there were steps of courtship. There were customs that they had to walk through. And I want to I step through just a few of these. Uh, again, I'm watching my time, but I want to step through some of these because I believe no matter what your age, no matter what your gender, no matter what you're calling in this place today, we need to understand what our responsibilities, what our privileges are as the people of God. And really, if I could say it this way, what we're supposed to be doing in these days as we are, if I, if I could say this, awaiting the return of our bridegroom. How many are looking forward to the day that our bridegroom breaks through those clouds, praise God? The Bible says when he breaks through those clouds that we're going to see him face to face, and that, that veil, that dimming glass that we see through will be lifted. I look forward to that day when I can look Jesus in the eyes and I know that I'm free of sin and I'm all clear and I can see him and understand him and know him in a way that I've never known him before. Just as yesterday, Sophia and David looking each other in the eyes in a new way after they gave the kiss and the rings, it was done. And so now... All, all, everything's off. Everything's off. They're married now. And so now they can just live and love each other and look each other in the eyes in a very, very wonderful, awesome way. Well, can I tell you, people of God, that day is coming for us. That day is coming for us when Jesus will break through those clouds. My wife and I will be driving somewhere, and Abby's in there sometimes, but we'll see a real beautiful cloud. You know, those big, white, pillowy, puffy ones, the cumulus or whatever they are. And those clouds will be up there in the sky, and I'll just say, my goodness, I believe that's the kind of cloud he's coming back in. I long for that day. Now, I know you young girls, you have a list, okay? You want to get married first. You want to have kids first. Now, all that's normal. I get that. But the reality is this. If Jesus Christ lives in your heart, he has placed in there a, a desire a, a, if I could say this, a, a looking forward to a craving for his return. When we can truly see this marriage of the bridegroom and the bride consummated. But in the meantime, we have things to do. And here's some of, here's some of the customs in the biblical days that are very, I think, we can learn from. Uh, and again, when we're looking at things that happen on earth, we don't then say compare it to heaven. We really want to compare heaven to earth, but we're going to, for the sake of, of illustration today and clarity, here's, what, here's some things that I want to look at. First is this, if a man, and I, I bet David did this, but if a man wanted to marry, he would first have to receive permission from the father and pay a price. And back in the Jewish days, they called that a bride price, okay? 
Today, in our, at least in, in my culture, they call it a dowry. You guys, the dowry, okay, where the, the guy brings, if, if you're in Africa, you bring cows, okay? If you want to marry a lady, uh, you go to the dad and you say, you know what, I really like your daughter and I'm interested in her and I would like to be engaged to her and how many cows is it going to cost me? It's true. I've been there, Tanzania. And if you're really rich, sometimes it might cost you. As one guy gave, had to give 40 cows. Now, that girl was worth a lot of money. She was really valued to give up because a cow is your livelihood. But you have this dowry. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's cows. Sometimes it's possessions. But it's in Egypt, they're all, they, they don't get married. The man doesn't get married till he's like 34, 35 because he has to spend... 15 years of his, of his adult life getting a car, getting an apartment, getting a job because it's expected. This bride price costs you something. Okay? And so just like David coming to Ivan, there was a, I don't know, did he give you cows? No goats? Nothing? Okay, sorry. Uh, but he had to come and he had to get permission. Yes. <laughs> Pastor Ivan said, yeah. He had to get permission. But can I tell you this and submit this to you today? There was a price for the bridegroom to receive his bride. There was, a, there was a price paid. The groom had to pay a price, and it wasn't cows that he had to pay to satisfy the father's demand for him to be betrothed to, to be in, uh, in court his future bride. And we understand this because we are lost and dead in our trespasses and sins. We know what that price was. Can I hear an amen? We know what that price was. It cost him his very life. You see, the father was up there. God could not be around any sin, and we are all born into sin. And so there had to be a price paid. The fancy word for that is propitiation, but the father had to be satisfied with a price. And you sang about it this morning. The price was the precious blood of Jesus Christ himself. Praise the Lord. And so there was this, this price, this dowry that he paid. The, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, don't turn there, chapter 6, but it says this. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Everybody say price. Price. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, therefore, it goes on to say, glorify God in your body. Which we've heard about today, about how we're to walk in holiness. Secondly, the man then would give his future bride a contract. There was a, 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 a pre, if I call it this way, a pre-covenant contract made. They sealed, David and, and Sophia yesterday made this lifelong covenant. But back in their engagement, when you get engaged and you ask the dad, can I marry your daughter and all those things, that kicks off this, this covenant thing, this contract. And in this contract, back in the Jewish days, they would make all kinds of promises. They would make promises about what they were going to give, what they were going to do, and those kinds of things. And I, you know, I, I did that with my wife. Before we got married, I, I wrote on a, a tablecloth while where I was asking her to marry me and begging her to marry me and praying that she'd say yes. I wrote on the tablecloth these different promises that we look at every once in a while to just see how I'm doing. Right now I'm making about a B, by the way. But I'd like to make, I, I hopefully someday will work up to being an A+. Plus. But I'm doing okay, but I made these promises. Well, just like David made some promises to Sophia in this betrothal and in this engagement about how he was going to love her and take care of her, how he desired to be with her forever, so too does our bridegroom give us a contract. And that contract comes in the form of a book known as the Word of God. He gave us, when he made this new covenant, he also implemented this contract, this covenant. What a book of promises. Can I hear an amen? Amen. What a book of promises. In here it says that he will live inside of us forever. Now it doesn't get any better than that. But then there's other promises like he will cause our soul to prosper. Other promises like he will give us the very best that he has. Other promises like he will give us the power and the grace 
to accomplish everything that he's called us and asked us to do. Aren't those great promises today? And so just like David made some promises to Sophia, our bridegroom, Jesus Christ himself, has given us one of the greatest gifts he could ever give us called the Word of God, the Bible, the Holy Book. What a covenant, what a contract. Then the bridegroom, after the betrothal, he would leave. In that culture, he would leave. Sorrowfully, the bride would watch as her future husband would go away. But she wasn't left without hope. She understood that he was going away for a very important purpose. I heard Pastor Ivan, he shared with me yesterday that David's building on a place, a home. And he might have to go up and help finish it to get, it, get, it, to get her done in time. Okay? But that's what David did. David, he's from Nebraska, right? So David from Nebraska, once he asked Ivan to marry Sophia, he just didn't come hang out at Ivan's house every day. No. He went back and worked, amen? He went back and prepared a house and a place for Sophia. Now, it might not be finished yet, but it will be someday. And so that's what in the Jewish culture what they would do is after the engagement, then the bridegroom would leave. But it was with great purpose. He would leave for a season. And during that season, he would begin to get the things ready for what his bride was going to live in and do. Praise God. What's that sound like? Disciples, after 40 days, after Jesus had risen again, and they think they're going to be with Jesus forever now. They think he's going to establish an earthly kingdom. But he had a surprise for them. He told them, he said, I'm going to go away. Now, how fearful would that be? I'm going to go away. I'm going to leave you. And as we understand, as we see in the Bible, he ascended in the clouds. And they were standing there watching him go away, just like the, the, the betrothed bride would watch her hu husband, her future husband, go away. The disciples were standing there, and they're watching in the clouds. And, and then the angels come and talk to him and says, No, you, you know what you were assigned to do. Don't stand there looking, because the same one who has ascended will return someday, praise God. And so Jesus, he went away with the great purpose. He didn't just go away to leave us by ourselves. And by the way, we're not by ourselves. He sent his precious Holy Spirit, amen. But his job right now is the Bible says that he's in heaven preparing a place for us. It talks about streets of gold. I don't understand it all. I won't even try to preach on it because I don't understand enough about it to preach on it. Heaven. But it says, the Bible says in one place that he's preparing a mansion for us. That kind of sounds like a house. I've been to, I, I love his house. You know, as a brother, you know, they talk about in the Bible, if you see a brother in need, you should just give him what you have. So I'm just waiting for the day Ivan gives me his house. That'd be a, I, do you love me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he's got a whole bunch of kids to raise yet. But it's a beautiful house. Just imagine the kind of house that's being prepared for the bridegroom in this day up in heaven. We don't even see it. We don't understand it all. But can I tell you, it's real. And again, I don't know if it's a physical house. I don't know what it looks like. I just know I'm going to get to experience it. How about you? Praise God. And so the husband goes away for a, sp a specific purpose to prepare things. Just like our bridegroom has went away. 1 John 14, verse 1 through 3 says this. We should take great comfort in this today. It says, do not let your heart be troubled. Has anybody ever let your heart be troubled? I have, even this week. Okay, I won't act super spiritual before you. There are times we let our hearts be troubled. But it says this, believe in God. Believe also on me, says Jesus Christ. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Another translation says mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go, listen to this, this is what the bridegroom says. This is what Jesus Christ says. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I, now listen to these promising, wonderful words. I will come again. Do you know that's an anchor for our soul? He will come again. And he says, I will receive you to myself, that where I am, 
there you may be also. Now, I want to get more to a little bit practical here. During, but during this, before the bridegroom would come back, he would go away to do some things, take care of the house, take care of things like that. But the bride had responsibilities as well. And who's the bride this morning? Say, we are. Okay, we're the, we're the bride. So are the, there are responsibilities, there are privileges, there are assignments, there are callings that we have as the church, as the people of God that we're supposed to be doing in this day while our bridegroom is at, in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, preparing a place for us, preparing a home for us. So again, after the, after the betrothal, the, the bride would sorrowfully but with great anticipation watch her husband depart to prepare a home while she would remain in the father's house. During this time of separation, which was usually back in this culture, in, in the Bible days, it was 12 months. I don't know, how, how long did David and Sophia court engagement? Half a year. So six months, sometimes it's 12 months, sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. But in the Jewish culture, it was about 12 months that they were separated. The bride would then, her responsibility was to make herself ready. Can everybody say ready this morning? Oh, a little more enthusiasm. Say ready. ready. Okay, this is our job. Our job today as the people of God, as the church of the living God, as the bride is to make ourselves ready. Ready for what? Ready for his return. I mean, imagine Sophia yesterday. Was she beautiful or what? Every hair in place, how does that work? I mean, makeup girls, you, I mean, the time she took to prepare herself to be so beautiful in the dress, the, the particular dress and, and the, the care, she just didn't show up here in her, cut off, in her shorts, in her sandals, you know, woke up fresh out of bed, didn't brush her teeth, natty hair, and come, okay, I'm ready to marry you, David. She didn't do that. She spent hours thinking about what she should look like. She spent hours dreaming about what the dress should look like. She spent, as girls go, they spend a lifetime thinking about what their marriage is going to look like. Can I tell you, that's okay. Because that's just a small taste of how we as the people of God should be looking forward to our wedding day and preparing for it. And so with great care, Sophia was preparing herself. And, and with great care in the Jewish days, they were preparing their cells. They would be preparing them, their cells physically, making sure they have their hair and everything just right. But they would also be preparing themselves in their mind and in their commitment, really in their hearts. I'm sure as men, as a woman of God, Sophia was spending time, even as they prayed, could you guys sense the presence of God yesterday with all the prayers that were being prayed? And especially when they pray, they knelt down here. That was very special. And they knelt down here, and each one of them said a prayer. And you could sense and feel the presence of God fall on that prayer. And that wasn't the first time they'd ever prayed for each other. Because Sophia, in her preparation, I'm sure she prayed for David. I'm sure David prayed for her. But it wasn't just preparation of her body. It wasn't just preparation of her dress. It was preparation of her mind and her heart and her being set apart to David for the rest of her life. It's that kind of preparation that we as the people of God and the church of the living God should be making in these days. Preparing ourselves for our husband's return. To prepare for a wedding garment. And the greatest gift the bride could give her husband was her purity and loyalty. It's the greatest gift. Can I tell you, young people, there's no greater gift you can give your husband, your future husband, than your purity and your loyalty. It's a wonderful gift to have eyes only for him. And that's one of the things that we as the church are preparing for in this day. You guys aren't coming to get me, are you? Okay. I thought maybe my time was up and they were coming to get me. They're pretty mean-looking guys. I'm wondering what they're doing back there. But here we are as the people of God, the church, the bride making herself ready. By the way, that, that, that robe, that garment, you know what the Bible calls it? You know what garment we get to wear? The Bible calls it a robe of righteousness. Praise the Lord. That beautiful robe that she had on yesterday was awesome. 
but it does not compare to the robe that we're going to wear when we see Jesus face to face. It's called the robes of his righteousness. Can I hear an amen on that one? Not my righteousness, but his righteousness. That's the robe. But what, what the Lord's looking for, what are, there's nothing more precious for me with my beautiful bride that she can give me is her loyalty and the understanding that I know that she only has eyes for me. That she intends that I'm the only man she's ever going to stare at and look at. That I'm the only man that she's going to honor and love and respect and give her a heart to. That I'm the only man that she's going to set herself apart for as holy. Only for me. That's the most precious gift that a wife can give her husband. Is that true, husbands? We want a wife that's faithful. We want a wife that we can trust. We want a wife that we know that she won't have these wandering eyes. Well, can I tell you today, as the people of God and the church of the living God, that's the kind of bride God wants to make us into in this day. I heard songs today. I heard preachings today about being holy, about being righteous. That's important in our preparation mode as the church today. I said, what are we preparing for? One of the things we're preparing for is that I today in the earth will only have eyes for Jesus. There are many things in our lives, and I don't care what age you are, young to old, there are many things in our eyes, there are many things in our life that want to get our eyes off of Jesus and onto other things, worldly things, more money. Careers and jobs is a big one. That was a big challenge for me when I was in my 20s. I was a well-educated person. And I was, was, as a Christian, had the pull of, the, of, of, there's nothing wrong with money. We understand that. There's nothing wrong with possessions. We understand that. But it is the love of them that gets us in trouble. And I had a, I had a pulling and a, a, almost a, uh, something that pulled me away because I was wanting to get a job, the highest paying job I could get. Why was that? Because I could say in that young walk that I had with God, I still had not committed to have eyes only for him. But praise God, that came as I lived life and served him. And can I tell you, that's what our bridegroom is looking for. He's looking for a faithful bride, a holy. The Bible says what? Be holy as I am. Holy. And so here we have the Father in heaven. He's the one who said that. Why did he say that? We understand in the church, we understand that the reason Pastor Ivan gave David the permission was because he was serving Jesus. I would say that if David had come as a, a lost person, an unbeliever, not in the church, and said, hey, I'd like to marry your daughter, Ivan would say, no. Because we don't want unevenly yoked. We want Christians to marry Christians. We want believers to marry believers. We want holiness. Again, that union. The Bible says, how can sweet water and bitter water exist out of the same fountain? Well, Father in heaven's looking for the same thing. He's looking to build a, and prepare a bride that's befitting the king, that's befitting his son. He doesn't want an unevenly yoked bride with a, a pure and holy bridegroom. You say, well, how... Can we get to that place? Can I tell you today? It's a miracle. It only happens by the grace of God. I can't be pure and holy. Again, they sang it. By the precious blood of Jesus. Not only is, my, is he my bridegroom, but he provides the way that I can be the bride. Praise the Lord. And so even in my weakness, even in my failures, even in my, in my sometimes sin... Because of the grace of God, because of repentance, because of forgiveness, because of his blood, I can stand before him holy and set apart. And when he breaks through those clouds someday, I can answer the call, not because of anything I've done. And so again, this today in the earth, we have a responsibility to set ourselves apart, to prepare ourselves to really love him and be looking for him. I'm, I'm going to go quickly here. This is our job today. This is where we find ourselves. Revelations 19, 7 through 8 says this. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Praise the Lord. Do you know that's a promise? And you know that's not only a prom promise, that's a prophetic picture of what will be. 
that we will be made ready. It was given to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen. Here it is, the righteous acts of the saints. Now, when it was time for the wedding, the husband would head out to receive his bride. The street would be lit with people holding candles. This was a tradition. You had your traditions yesterday by the people walking up and announcing who they were. It's very beautiful. I loved it. In the Jewish culture, the bride, when the bridegroom would be coming, they would light candles. That's where the parable comes from about the ten virgins having their candles ready. You remember that story? About always looking, always watching. When's that... I'm helping the bride out here. When's that, like the, maid of, the, the maids of honor and all that kind of stuff, they're watching, they're watching, they're watching. While the, while the bride's back here preparing herself, these, these attendants are out there watching with their candles lit. And when the bridegroom finally says it's time, when the father says it's time, then they would light the road and then here he would come. Praise the Lord. Here he would come. And so that was the responsibility was to be looking for. Can everybody say looking for? This is something that we miss in the church many times today. Looking for the return of the bridegroom. Looking for his return. Longing for it. And this is again what we're supposed to be doing. Making ourselves ready. And so as the people of God we understand just as the bridegroom would return in the Jewish day and come with, with the candles lit on the road. I won't read it for the sake of time. But it's one of my favorite passages is the Bible says that our groom's returning and there is going to be a shout. Because that's what they did in the Jewish day. As they lit the place, when they, said, when they saw the bridegroom coming from a distance, it says that these attendants would lift up a shout. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Well, praise the Lord. Our bridegroom is coming again. And the Bible says that a trumpet will sound and there will be a shout. Praise the Lord. Why is there a shout? Well, because we've been so looking for him, the excitement of seeing him and glorifying him, oh my goodness, how can we put words on it? So again, we're, we're preparing ourselves. We're not so, getting so lost in this world. I like to say it this way, because you say, yeah, but God has called us to live in this earth and to see his kingdom come, and that's true. Very powerful. And so how do I look for him and yet keep my feet on the ground and accomplish the will of God on the earth? I like to simplify it this way. I should live every day as if he's coming back. But I should build. I should do. I should occupy. I, I should fulfill my calling as if it's not for 100 years. Why do I say it that way? Because nobody knows. There are people who try to say they know or try to figure out. Nobody knows. Only the Father knows that, that day. But oh my goodness, as we love him, we should be longing for that day. I'm wrapping up. Lastly, the bridegroom and the bride would unite in marriage. This is looking at the Jewish culture. This is looking at what happened yesterday. And there would be a great wedding feast. Did we have a great feast yesterday? That was awesome. I couldn't decide which type of meat to take, so I took all of them. Twice. It was a great wedding feast with dancing and rejoicing, and they would live together forever. And the bride would give herself wholly to the bridegroom. Revelations 19, 9 says, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Do you understand there's a marriage feast coming? The Bible says we're all a part of it. And the Bible says that it's something that we're going to all partake of one day and that the servant who gets up from the table and serves us is the bridegroom himself. What a wonderful groom we have. He's not a domineering, you're beneath me kind of, kind of king. He's a king who took off his robes and took a towel and knelt down and washes our feet. He's a king. He's a bridegroom who nailed, and I say it this way, who nailed himself to the cross. Oh, there might have been men who drove the nails, but he laid himself willingly on the cross. What a bridegroom we have. Can I hear an amen? And this is, this is who we're preparing ourselves. This isn't just what we're preparing ourselves for. This is who we are preparing ourselves for. It's like heaven's dressing room. Just like, you know, the wedding started a little bit late yesterday and stuff because I was watching the dad. And they're looking out the door. And we were, you know, we, didn't, we don't understand Russian 
So we hear all the service, but we kind of figured things out. And we had a wonderful young lady who helped us. What, what was her name again? Anna. Praise God. Anna helped us out yesterday. And so we kind of caught things. But we're watching. I said this. I said, I bet they're waiting on the bride. I bet they're waiting on her. And sure enough, here she came. And when she came, everything was ready to begin. And then we had the wonderful wedding. And then we had the wonderful wedding feast. What a wonderful story. We all got to see it yesterday. But that's just a small glimpse of the story that God's allowed us to be a part of. That we in this day as his bride, we're preparing ourselves. We're setting ourselves apart. We're making ourselves holy. We're, we're preparing our, our heart and our mind and our lives. We're, we're being faithful. We're, setting, we're keeping our eyes only on him. We're thinking only on him. We're really putting him at the center, the very center of our lives. This is what we're to be doing today. And I pray for all of you today in this room. You came here for a wonderful wedding, to be here as family, to be here as the church. And again, we got to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Pastor Ivan. But God bless you, this wonderful family. But understand, there's a calling upon your lives as you go back home. There's a calling upon your lives as you stay here around Indianola, that you prepare yourself, that you honor, obey, trust, Follow Jesus the groom.